Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Let's see if this works. You've had a chance to look at that for a while. This is possibly going to look at it from a little bit different perspective than we have before. Not that repetition is a bad thing. In fact, I am very convinced that repetition is our friend, that it's by repeating that we learn and that we build habits and that we be transformed. A lot of the process of transformation, which all of us uh, should aspire to, is by repetition, whether that's physical exercise or whether it's learning. Here's the word study part. The Greek word translated gospel is euangelion, which I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's pronounced the same today that it was 2000 years ago when the New Testament was written. It's from the same as a good message or, or good news. And then there's some other related Greek words there to announce the good news or to evangelize or the person who does it, a preacher, an evangelist. But this concept of good news, why? Why is it good news? And what is the good news? And how does it contrast with other news? First passage I want to look at is in 1 Corinthians 15, the first five verses here, or actually verse one through four. Uh, I have a typo in the, in the reference. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. And this is related to the discussion about vows and oaths and promises and letting your yea be yea, the, and transforming that I was talking about, that the gospel is something that you take a stand about or not. You can either reject it or accept it. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. And there's a number of important doctrines that are touched by that verse. Paul goes on to say, otherwise, you have believed in vain. That means it's worthless, it's empty. It does you no good. If you don't hold firmly to the gospel. If you hold firmly to the gospel, you will be saved. You could even say you are saved as long as you keep in mind you could believe in vain if you don't stand fast in that, hold firmly to that. And that's an important biblical truth. That's an important piece of the good news. That you have to stand, stand firm, hold fast, continue, Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. And we just encountered a controversial point, because the majority of people who claim Christianity don't really believe Jesus died, or they define death different than the rest of that phrase, for our sins according to the scriptures, in agreement with the scriptures, and as represented by the scriptures. So it's imperative that we understand the scriptures about death, 
What does it mean that Jesus died? It's of first importance in the gospel. I don't believe we can overstate the importance of understanding it in agreement with the scriptures. Verse 4, that he, Jesus, was buried. Not just a meat shell was stuck in a tomb. Jesus was buried. And that he, Jesus, was raised on the third day, again, according to the scriptures. So in agreement with the scriptures and as instructed and stated by the scriptures. The good news that Paul preached and that can save is a very specific and powerful gospel. In Galatians 1, we see another uh, discussion by Paul about how important the gospel is. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. The gospel has an enemy. The gospel has an evil counterpart, and that's called the present evil age. Now, when Paul was writing this 2,000 years ago, it was still an evil age. Are things worse today? Yes, they are, but it's the same evil. Maybe higher percentage, but there's no new sins. There haven't been new sins for the history of mankind. There's just different mechanisms for achieving sin now. But the sins have been the same for all of human history. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present age, evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the battle. The will of God versus the present evil age. Verse 6, I'm astonished. Paul's writing to this church in Galatia. says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. I am convinced we have to see Paul as deeply concerned, as teaching that it's absolutely critical to have the true gospel rather than a perverted gospel. Verse 9, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. And this text doesn't stand alone. The New Testament has many references that talk about how critical it is to have the true gospel. In the beginning of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. He was talking about a, a squabble or a, a, a discussion that was going on in Corinth about who had the better baptism. And Paul's going, don't drag me into this. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 
not with wisdom of words. He wasn't trying to persuade people by being just this eloquent speaker. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The focus is on Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus was resurrected. And this proves the good news. This proves God's message. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And that is an important connection that will help us in other passages. The power of God is preaching. It's preaching the gospel, the true gospel. It's the message. <clears throat> For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, yes, he has, but most people don't agree that he has. Will it become glaringly obvious? Yes, it will, but it'll be too late for the world at that point. Right now, you can look at the internet and see all kinds of very famous people very powerful, eloquent speakers who are dramatically opposed to the gospel and who have huge followings and are very popular and in, in some cases have become very wealthy because they appear to be worldly wise. So the disputer of this world, the scribes and the, the scholars and the entertainers and the scientists are everywhere in the world. They're all over the internet. They're all over magazines and any other way that you get information. Criticizing the gospel and contradicting the gospel. Verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God's got a purpose, a prime directive. There's a reason that he got this process that we see in the chart over here started. There's a reason he created the universe and mankind and has interacted with mankind and has seen to it that his message is available. The Bible is the most common book on the planet. There isn't a country where they've never heard of this Jesus Christ guy. There may be some indigenous tribes in some kind of a jungle somewhere that have not heard because they kill anybody that comes to the beach. But anybody who's seeking, asking, has heard of the gospel. They may not know the details, but they've heard of it. In the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, by its wisdom, doesn't know God. So it pleased him by what, by a method that the world thinks is foolish. The world tries to convert people by changing laws and then forcing that down your throat. Worst case scenario, killing you if you don't comply. God has chosen a method 
of converting one person at a time, persuading one person at a time to believe is gospel, is good news. As I was preparing this, the observation that this is a conflict of worldviews. A worldview is the overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. Been quite a bit of headlines lately about the web, the James Webb, if I'm getting the name right, telescope that they launched. And now they can look back billions of years because they can see so far. The way light works is that there's particles that are traveling at the speed of light. So if you can see far enough away, you're going back in time is the thought process there. Well, what they found out, surprise, surprise, is they used to think X, but now they know Z, and they still don't know Y. <laughs> <clears throat> but it, it pits the biblical worldview against this apparent huge array of scientific knowledge and brain power. It's two very starkly contrasted worldviews. <clears throat> and it, it, it affects how you see and interpret the world. It's a collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an individual or a group. It's one's personal view of the world and how you interpret it. And understanding God's plan puts everything that we see around us in a very different light than believing that there was nothing and it blew up and became this amazing universe that we see. In spite of the fact that the mathematicians and the scientists acknowledge it's really impossible. It is so impossible. All of the criteria needed for the universe to turn out the way that it is. That mathematically and scientifically, they know it couldn't have happened. So the only way around that is to say there's multiple universes in order to get the odds so that they can work. And I'm not making this up. This is readily available conclusions by people completely convinced of the scientific gospel. There's a conflict of worldviews. Now that there aren't just those two worldviews, but those are the predominant ones in Western civilization. Paul goes on in the next chapter to talk about this conflict of worldviews. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. 
For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man? So what in you knows your thoughts? That's your spirit. Whatever in you knows your thoughts, that is your spirit. And if a doctor puts a mask over your face and gives you the right chemicals, your spirit quits. And you hope that it was the right amount of those chemicals so that you wake up and your spirit comes back. <clears throat> it starts up again. When we look at the scriptures talking about the spirit of God, it's dealing with God's mind, his intellect, his identity, his values, his attitudes, and the power that's produced by God's mind. Many of the miracles were performed by the power that is produced by God's mind. But it's what causes us to know our thoughts. And learning God's thoughts is acquiring God's spirit. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. That's the way you acquire understanding of God's thoughts. And these thoughts of God are in direct contradiction to the thoughts of the world. The wisdom of God is in contrast to the wisdom of the world. The spirit of God is in contrast with the spirit of the world. The gospel is in stark contrast with the world's view of the universe. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things also we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words expressing God's values, expressing God's plan, expressing God's reality in contrast and in contradiction to the world's explanation of reality. What's real? Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing? What's going to happen? all of those aspects of what has been real, what is currently real, and what's going to be real. And a lot of us have been completely astounded at how disconnected the world is becoming from what's real in many different arenas. Verse 14, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And there's a lot of people who are very famous for their expression of how foolish religion is. And sadly, for the most part, they're right. But not always. Not when it comes to the true gospel. But sadly, the world is full of false gospels, perverted gospels. Another of Satan's tools. He cannot understand, understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of of the Lord, that he should instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. And in this chapter, there's 
there's several different phrases that are used synonymously. Mind, spirit, wisdom. Those scripturally are synonymous terms. Understanding the mind of God takes study, takes research, and it takes pondering and, and meditating on those things. In Romans 1, Paul again, writing to uh, another congregation in, in Rome this time, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the good news of God, from God, about God, all of those things are true which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel was promised by God through the prophets. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, a literal descendant of David. And we know from Scripture also of Abraham also of Adam and Eve and Noah, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And Paul makes this point a number of times that God raising Jesus from the dead firmly established a number of things. One, that Jesus was and is the one called the Son of God, the Son of Man, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham. That resurrection nailed that down and proved it. Also, that resurrection absolutely proves the concept. He was the first fruits of them that slept. There's no more question about, can God do it? If, there, if anybody was questioning it. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostles, apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. And that's an interesting phrase, obedience of faith. Is it faith or is it works? It's both. You've got to obey the faith. It demands action. Among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. <laughs> To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel has power. And that power is to save. If you believe. And as long as you hold fast to that belief. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And this is that clash of worldviews. Throughout the history of mankind, unrighteousness has tried to suppress the truth. Unrighteousness 
has been in combat against the righteousness of God, the godliness that the good news requires. The good news is God's going to win. The gospel is going to be real. The promises made are going to come to pass. Part of the proof of that are promises that were made that have already come to pass, chief of which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And I had mentioned a minute or two ago that the scientific community has been forced to accept that their version of what caused the universe is impossible with the odds that are required. And part of that conversation is about the fine tuning of the universe, how it is intricately balanced. And if any little thing changes, everything's dead or it just doesn't work. It implodes. There's all kinds of catastrophic things that math would determine would happen to the universe if it wasn't for just intricately fine-tuned laws. But in spite of that, and you can see it in the conversations, the scientists set their jaw and insist that it's going to happen that way anyway. Don't even talk about creation. That absolute, that's off the table to start with. That's forbidden as a, as a worldview. For since the creation of the world, that's a controversial subject, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. The more man looks out at the universe and down into the tiniest little particles, the more awesome God becomes. When I was a kid, the view of cells when I was a really little kid, <laughs> the view of cells was extremely simplistic. It basically was a shell with a bunch of goo. But as mankind has looked deeper and deeper and smaller and smaller, they've discovered that it is mind bogglingly complex. And that within the cell are little machines that build other machines and then take them apart and put them together over in another place. And where's the instruction set? Where's the ingredient list? They don't know. And they admit that they don't know. But they're absolutely not going to accept this account of how it happened. No way. That's an opposing world law. But God's power and divine nature have been clearly seen even before the scientists could look down into the cell. All you had to do is look around and be astounded at the order and the beauty and the complexity of what is readily visible and, and, and understandable. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures 
idolatry is what this is talking about, predominantly. <laughs> Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. And one of the hallmarks of idolatry is sin. For they exchanged the truth of God, and I believe we can insert gospel here, for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Many of the elements of this are still directly applicable, even in a, an attempting to be godless civilization. They're still going about the same denial process and coming to the same end result. Being given over to the lusts of their hearts. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. <laughs> for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own flesh the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, that's the first step, they rejected God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. I don't believe this means God made them do improper things, but he gave them over to it, allowed them to go on their way down the drain. In this next chapter, Paul writes, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, their result, their reward is eternal life. To those who by patient continuance, they will get eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they get indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. A few verses later, Paul says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Paul's version of the gospel is, what you see around us, this world around us, the evil people are going to be destroyed. They're going to get indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. The people that are doing good, they're going to get eternal life. That's the gospel. And that is preached even all the way back into the Old Testament. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel before to Abraham saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith, those who believe, those who obey the gospel are blessed with Abraham the believer. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. <coughs> there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. 
So why is this worldview good news? This specific worldview, it's directly opposed by the majority worldview and others, but why is it good news? I mentioned that repetition is good. We're going to look at this text again. Because the result is eternal life, glory, honor, and peace. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, God's appointed Jesus as his judge, as the judge that's going to judge the world for him. And the world that we see around us, the universe and all of the inhabitants, are subject to this plan. It's built for God's purpose. Those that believe will get eternal life. Let's conclude with a song. Song number one, God's promises are sure. <laughs> Song number one. <laughs> that you would help us to understand accurately the 
things that we read. We thank you for your son who so courageously gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins as, and as a perfect example for us. Please forgive us for our many sins and weaknesses. Help us to become pleasing in your sight and a good example to those around us. We pray for the soon coming of your son and that we would all find a place in that wonderful kingdom that you have promised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.